everybody. Welcome back to Linux Weekly. Daily Wednesdays where we sit back, relax, take that midweek break, talk about some of the fun things going on in the world of Linux and open source. I'm Vince Stone, joined by Joe Bryan. We're just hello, talking, hello. chatting back and forwards. Uh, Slack has updated their terms of service. If you don't know Slack, you probably use it at work. Hopefully you have a paid business account if you use it for work, but if you don't, well, I hope you haven't been using it for your organization or your community or your companies like data dump and repo because they're going to delete your history selectively like yeah. when they feel like it <laughs> it's not going to be a fun time and if you don't think that's going to happen to discord at some point don't be a fool oh yeah okay, well yeah one thing i posted in the forums have you done any benchmarks using that qualcomm snapdragon x because the only one i could find was this wee little tiny one from 2023 <laughs> and i really want to know you know naturally you know being interfacing linux like the, what does it, how does it handle with audio interfaces? How does it get the capability it's got USB 4 and it can have Thunderbolt? Like, can we use that with an external dock? Because there are Linux drivers for like Blackmagic hardware, among other things. NVIDIA even has um, Linux ARM drivers. I, I just want to see all that stuff for just, if, if you have Debian up and running on one, because, you know, we talked about it on this show a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. Qualcomm has a experimental version of Debian, a raw disk image that you can pop on there and play with. Could you put it on? I know that's asking a lot from Windows reviewers, but I mean, <laughs> if, you, if you happen to know somebody, be like, hey, you could do this. You, get, you definitely would get some views yeah. on that YouTube video. But yeah, that, that's pretty much all I've been doing, Jill. I've been sitting here jonesing. My brain has been working on overdrive, doing yeah. hard as it can to try to justify making any financial sense to spend twelve hundred dollars on one of these and i can't do it oh, okay i cannot i have been i've been slapped down and rejected from the brain boss multiple hey, yeah. times so we'll wait i'll keep my eye out and you know maybe in a couple of years when or maybe sooner than that depends on if these things flop or not um i'd be able to pick one up you know for like five six hundred bucks but like twelve hundred yeah. bucks two thousand dollars New. <laughs> no, <laughs> you... sir. What about you, Jill? Uh, you've, uh, I, I see, I, I can tell by, I can read through the tea leaves that you're going to hold something up. I sure For am. our audio listeners <laughs> to look <Yes>. at. Yes. <laughs> so I got this beautiful new transparent pink and purple keyboard from Ubodi on Amazon. Isn't that pretty? For those that aren't listening to the listening or watching excuse me watching the video <laughs> i can't see it how beautiful this keyboard is it's a dual mode with two wireless bluetooth connections and an rf connection via usb which i have fallen in love with i love dual mode keyboards and you know i've shown off my 60 percent transparent mechanical keyboards before that is lit with RGB, but this Ubodi keyboard has no RGB and doesn't need it because it is so freaking beautiful. <laughs> I just love it. Well, really I nice. hope it is. I hope you don't lose it. I hope it's transparent, not transparent to the point where it goes misplaced. <laughs> yeah, which I don't you can't think that's going to be a problem. <laughs> no. <laughs> Something that's definitely not transparent is this guy. Look at that. This yeah. is the Menisform V3 AMD tablet very nice oh yeah uh <laughs> mudkip.me there'll be a link to everything in the show notes but we decided to take it and put some linux on it now maybe you've never heard about this tablet i kind of knew about it because hey we do this uh this thing's powered by the 8840u from amd so it's got some you know chunk behind it and it's got a 14 inch screen 40 watt battery 32 gigajoules of memory ram all for under a thousand bucks i'm like Kind of interested. They'll even toss in a copy of Windows 11 if you're feeling dirty. And mm -hmm. good news, everybody. All the hardware worked out of the box using Fedorf and uh, even the fingerprint reader just like yeah. worked out of the box. No problems. Touchscreen, um, no problems. And KDE turns out even has a tablet mode, which I've never went looking for. So you don't have to squint unless you want to. Unfortunately, a couple of the downsides no auto rotation and the volume buttons only work when a keyboard's attached because reasons. Mm. Uh, that one's mm -hmm. kind of weird. Uh, runtime though is not great. You get about six hours if you baby it and uh, battery drain during sleep. It's not too bad. About one to 2% overnight, you know, eight hours, however long you sleep. And, um, 
One thing that made me a little bit sad, you know, the touch pin, all the writing, they said it was responsible, irresponsible, responsive, and responsible. Yes. <laughs> it worked no problems with that, which is good to see because, you know, you get a tablet, people are going to want to draw on it, and that's good. Uh, yeah. But the, you know, you're thinking, you get this 14 inch screen, like, this is awesome because you can use it as a, you know, secondary or monitor or, you know, tack it onto something else. And you're like, that's awesome. Even more awesome is it's a touchscreen monitor. Unfortunately, the touchscreen support doesn't work when it's being used as an external monitor, which is quite unfortunate because that would have been very, very handy yeah. to have. Um, full write up, you know, I just glossed over a couple of the high points. And this is something that you can go out and buy, including like a little um, keyboard. You know, I always buy like a nice little keyboard for any tablet. That is my daily driver. So uh, it's good to see. I think really the only downside is, you know, it's under a thousand bucks just, but the battery life, because you're still dealing with the x86. I don't know. Uh, it's good to see that Linux just works on it out of the box. So, you know, you normally, yeah. when you would think about putting Linux on, you know, like, I don't even know if you can get Linux on a Surface Book. Let me know in the comments. But something like that, you know, something that's going to be detachable. Uh, you, you're going to be up for a weekend project, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, usually. <laughs> yeah, you're not going to be up for a weekend project on this. It just, yeah, just works. Just so, works. Yeah, which could be a detriment because I, I know there's parts of my brain I'm like, well, that's not going to be fun to play with. It'll just do the thing. I'm like, so. <laughs> And it does have NVMe storage. So, I mean, it's fast, man. Ah, yeah, Vin. And this, you know, maybe this is the portable Linux tablet you've been, you know, waiting for. I would want Pretty to good. play with one of these because I would like to see what the KDE tablet experience is. And look, here, there, there's some anime stuff. There you go. Not yeah. how much would you pay? Put your yeah, anime thing on it. Mudkip's says that the performance is outstanding and it actually performed better than their m1 imac with many tasks and and that's high praise indeed i was impressed <laughs> let's go ahead and move on to team green no yeah. not that team green ah uh, geekos i have uh, lots of geekos here in, in my room by my penguins and uh so SUSECON 2024 was last week in berlin germany and there was actually a huge announcement for the SUSE Linux Enterprise Server, or SLES, 15 Service Pack 6 release. It includes long-term support for a whopping 19 years. <laughs> That's really impressive. That is seven more years than Canonical's Ubuntu LTS, which was recently extended to 12 years. Some of the new features of SUSE Linux Enterprise Server 15 Service Pack 6 include a new open SSL 3.1 library for better security compliance, and SLES is a new feature that encrypts your data and memory, not just in hard drive storage or while being sent over the internet. And that's a really cool feature. I've played with Susie, I've played with SLES, SLED, uh, all the fun things. I know people who use it in production. I also don't know a single person who uses Susie that likes it, mm -hmm. who has to tango with it day in and day out. That's <laughs> just being reported from people who have to tango with it, not us end users sitting at home playing with it on occasion. That yeah. said, this comes in response, mm -hmm. man, because uh, Canonical recently extended their LTS to 12 years. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Oh, and they got 19, and I'm looking at that, and I'm like, that's good. That's an option. You know, this is more like marketing and stuff like that. But, you know, hey, if you're looking for like long term, long term, you know, you're definitely going to give Susie a look. It's going to be in the contention with your things like, you know, your Red Hat and, you know, um, what are we, all the ones, Rocky, mm -hmm. Alma. Yeah, Rocky, Alma. Yeah. <laughs> Remember when it was simple? I was sent, you can't use CentOS streams anymore. So, uh, yeah. Uh, that's always kind of fun, man, when you see stuff like that. And, and they're getting caught up, man. Like, you know, you, you got to think like Windows. Windows has got usually a five, 10 year support window on server side. And Mac OS doesn't really have a server option anymore. I remember XServe. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, operating system support on the Mac side, usually three to five years. Still not quite, not quite the 20 years you're getting out of Solaris 11. But we're here to talk about Linux. Joe, you've been using Linux for at least three decades. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Easily. <laughs> Always um, <laughs> fascinated when somebody comes up, they do the chest pounding, like, I've been using Linux for 12 years. I'm like, oh, you're new. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Fascinating. 
<laughs> not a weird thing. Not a strange thing. Nothing I brag about or anything. Because I, you know, love me or hate me, I treat Linux like an operating system. I don't treat it like a religion and or cult, like some people do, you know. And uh, I ran across this also at ZDNet. Um, just browsing through, and I, I guess somebody needed to write an article, and I was hesitant to do it, but I thought it would be fun to go through it with everybody on the mm -hmm. show. <laughs> because I've used Linux for 30 years is the headline. Here are five reasons I will never switch to Windows or Mac OS. This comes at an interesting time, though. It does, because this week, Microsoft, everybody's favorite company, decided to automatically start backing up customers' data, turning OneDrive into opt-out. Sounds like Microsoft, doesn't it? Now, on top of that, they've also, like, very quietly removed the documentation from the website about creating local accounts in Windows 11. I wonder what that can mean. Mm -hmm. Who knows? Mm -hmm. You still can create, you have to do a little moon glyph. I think you could open a console and during the install to create it. You know, pretty easy for Microsoft. You know, they love doing stuff in consoles and terminals. Uh, maybe not. And I know, even when I'm sitting here saying this, like some of you are never going to leave the embrace of your Windows Dom Daddy. I get it. You can't do it. But some of y'all starting to wake up a little bit. You are. Yeah. Even you die hard users are like, this is getting unmanageable. Why? Because your Windows desktop exists for a couple of things you're starting to realize. It's there to collect telemetry on you. It's there to serve you ads and basically do whatever it wants when it wants and uh, without your consent. Now, yeah. mm -hmm. Microsoft is smart enough not to force it on you. What do they do? They wear you down. Like, mm -hmm. Wear yeah. you down. You're like, oh, we're going to cut this on. Oh, you can cut it off. Okay. Yeah. Oh, we're going to cut it back on again. Slow I'm going to cut it off. Progression over time. <laughs> Here we go. We're going to cut this back on and eventually, like, fine, yeah. fine, whatever. All right. I just, just go away. So, uh, what do you get for that, putting up that operating system? You get a couple of things, though. You get that illusion of choice, like, hey, I can do whatever I want. To an extent, you get the ease of use. I'm not going to deny, man. Like, if you're familiar with the Windows ecosystem, you can kind of pop in and just get going on that. And you got pretty okay hardware support. At least the vendors will target it. I'm not saying it's always going to work the best, but, you know, it's option number one. I thought it'd be fun to uh, take a look at this just because some of you are convinced switching to Linux is impossible. Like, maybe you want to. I'm not, if you're using Windows and you're like, I love this, this is awesome, it's great, that's cool. We can still hang out. I'm, I'm never going to try to talk you out of it. I'm like, you use what works for you. I'm not one of those weird Linux people. I'm not. Use what makes sense. And that just stops people sometimes because they think I'm going to argue with them. I'm like, I'm not arguing with you about an operating system. Get off my lawn. <laughs> yeah. It's just not going to happen. So uh, what if the roles were reversed, though? You know, Jack is saying he could never use Windows after 30 years of Linux. And I, I feel that. Mm -hmm. I've tried to use Linux. I've bounced into that. But, I mean, if it was flipped around, we'll talk about it in a minute, because I, I want to go through some of these uh, bullet points, starting with numero uno. Why? It makes sense. Now, this is a valid argument. Since any operating system you're familiar with, typically, well, you know what it does, it makes sense. You know what? I'm, I'm not going to give you a hard time about that. Let's go on to move number two. It's easy. No, it's not. Linux is <laughs> just as hard or easy as any other operating system you're unfamiliar with. Yeah. And if you try to argue with it, you're a fool. Go ahead. Um, leave a comment. Uh, what up do we have <laughs> next? Um, it lets me work how I want. Yeah. Linux is highly configurable. And you're probably going to need to crack open a terminal if you want to configure some of that stuff. You know, that was part of, uh, I kind of glossed over that in two, because a friend here said some people are able to use Linux for 20 years and never have to open a terminal. Yeah, well, if they're a casual user, yes. Like you give Linux to your grandparent and you just put Firefox on the desktop. And if that's all they use. Yeah. What do they do when it breaks? <laughs> what if it doesn't break? <laughs> I'm not asking about probability. What do they do when it breaks? It will eventually break. <laughs> what do you do then, Joe? You got to open a terminal. Well, yeah, uh, not always. Software centers sometimes fix things, especially in modern ones. That's like, another you know, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
Telling my, people that they're not going to have to open a terminal is lying to them. Oh, I know. <laughs> you're you're doing Linux if you're like a Linux evangelic. You're just like, right, everyone needs. Don't tell them they're not going to need to. You, you think you're doing good. You're like, no, it's going to be great. What happens when they need to open a terminal? Like, oh, I, I was just sold some faults. Good. You said this was never going to happen. All right. F this, I'm going back to Windows. Because that's what happens, despite what you think happens in your brain, because you're inside a little bubble. Get outside that bubble, see how the world works with other people. And they're like, I ain't got time for this. So you need to be prepare people for what they're going to get into. And that goes back, you know, working how you want, you know? And Linux is great for that. Because, again, it's highly configurable. No problem. As long as you don't mind crack open a terminal. I mean, how many times have we modified stuff on our desktop and you know, you, you know, crack open a copy of terminal? At least you're going to open G edit and edit a text file. Let's put it like that. Mm -hmm. Now let's move on to number four. Is it flexible? Yeah, man. Plenty of desktops, window managers to choose from, and they have yeah. things of configuration options. You can put stuff where you. It's not going to fight you. And even if you run into a desktop or window manager that fights you, there's going to be another one that doesn't. Beautiful. Linux excels at this. We crush it. Then we got the security thing. This is something we've known, I think, all of us for 30 years. Windows has never been secure. Why? Well, just down to its core design for the longest time, and also it's the biggest target, so it's got the most eyes on it. Um, secure by default. Yeah, by default, it's still only going to be as secure as the willingness of a user to type their pseudo password in, their root password in, when prompted, right? Yeah. Can we fight yeah. against that? No, you can't. So, um, yeah, if you're concerned about uh, privacy or customization, definitely give Linux a look, man. Because, like, those two things are they're being phased out on the Windows side. You yeah, know, your customization absolutely. options are shrinking, not expanding, and Microsoft is collecting more telemetry and more data about you, not less. And the uh, amount of, like, hoops you got to jump through in order to cut all that off. Like, if you don't mind, that's cool. Like, whatever. Like, I don't do anything on my PC. I don't care. Like, that's awesome. I'm not going to fight you over that. But don't let anybody convince you that switching operating system is going to be an easy transition. doesn't matter what operating system it is. If you move from one OS to another, it's just not going to be smooth. Not even a little bit. You're going to run into problems. Linux is no exception. If you move from Windows to Mac, you're still going to run into this, not the same problems. You're going to have a different set of problems. And they're going to exist. If you're on a Mac going to Windows, Mac going to Linux, those problems are still there. Yeah, you still have to learn how to use the operating system. Like you get to deal with about. all your applications yeah. and all your settings. All of mm -hmm. that's going to be different. So you got to be the adventurous sort, or at least you got to be sufficiently angry to give you that drive to be like, man, I got to get off this and onto something else. I'm here to tell you Linux is a viable option. It Absolutely. will do the job that you need it to do. Mm -hmm. But I want to ask everyone, let me know in the comments, what's keeping you from using Linux? Really, what is? Or, why don't you care? I also want to hear from you. I'm like, it's not bring system. It doesn't matter to me. I use Windows. Mm -hmm. I use Mac. I use everything. But I'm always curious about that person that genuinely has the desire to, but they're like, this thing's stopping me. Let me know if you got like a legitimate uh, use case desire to use Linux, or maybe like you still dual boot. That used to be a thing everybody did for the longest time. You know, they'd yeah. have a Windows partition, Linux partition. Mm -hmm. I, would, I would see people write, you're like, man, it's been a while since I booted up the Linux partition. Let me go do that and take a look. And, you, and maybe it just never clicked for you. That's another thing I want to know about. Like, yeah. Did you put a lot of time in it? It's like, just never worked <laughs> correctly for me. And it never did the thing. So, yeah. Go check out this article. It'll be a link in the show notes. And yeah, could I go back to using Windows after somebody myself using Linux as my only mm -hmm. well, and primary desktop? I used Solaris for over a decade. Yeah, I'm weirder than you deal with it. Um, but I couldn't. I know I couldn't because last week or the week before you heard me very yeah, much yeah. disgruntled about trying to find network settings in Windows 10. Yeah. <laughs> like, this, this is lunacy. This is maddening. And it, why? Because I just wasn't familiar with it. And 
you got to be able to have that empathy. You got to be able to flip that, you know, as somebody just, I know how to do this in Linux. Like, what am I going to do? I'm going to open a terminal and uh, fix that real quick and set that static IP address. But you got to be able to empathize from the Windows side coming to Linux. They're having those same feels that, and I had a reason to fight through it because I needed to get this thing where I had to extract mm -hmm. some information. If I didn't have a reason and I was trying to use that, I would have thrown it out a window. It was maddening. Some people feel that way about Linux. So uh, have some empathy for your brothers and sisters, you know? Yeah. Don't, don't just like, everything's just going to work. Just tone that down a little bit. Last but not least, everybody, Raspberry Pi Connect has uh, created a thing that I have questions about. But before I have those questions, Jill needs to tell you what it is. <laughs> Yeah, it's really cool. So about a month and a half ago here on LWW, actually number 422, we talked about Raspberry Pi launching Raspberry Pi Connect, which is an easy way to access your Raspberry Pi remotely via the web. Well, they have listened to the Raspberry Pi community for features. So a new beta of Raspberry Pi Connect has been released, but this time not only does it have support for the Raspberry Pi 5, 4, and 400, but for all the Raspberry Pi computers going back to the very first one, even the Raspberry Pi Model B released in 2012. Remember the, those times, Ben? I, I still have my Raspberry Pi Model B. Oh, yeah. I, I spent, uh, <laughs> it was the weekend project of compiling and doing. I finally got yeah. X to launch on it, and I had achieved victory, and I don't think I touched yes. it again for a few months. Okay. It yeah. took forever for the poor thing to start, but it did it, and yes, that was neat. Yes, it did eventually start, yes. And what's cool is this is, you know, regardless, it Th this feature will work regardless if you are running Raspberry Pi OS 32-bit or 64-bit or Raspberry Pi OS Lite or Raspberry Pi OS with the desktop, of course. And another great feature that is new is remote shell access. Raspberry Pi states on their news blog, the new remote shell feature in Raspberry Pi Connect enables you to launch a shell on your Raspberry Pi device from a web browser over a secure connection. This provides access to your Raspberry Pi without a desktop environment, extending support to older devices as well as devices running Raspberry Pi OS Lite. Remote shell access also works much better over low bandwidth connections than screen sharing, making it a handy option to have. Let me, let me tell you what you did. Let Here. me tell you what you did, Raspberry <laughs> Pi. You reinvented SSH with a bunch of extra steps thrown in. That's what you got going on right here. Let's not pretend it's anything different. If it is, somebody <laughs> needs to let me know because what, what I'm reading right here is like, that's SSH. Like, yeah. if you're giving me console access, I'm like, it's some things you got to keep in mind when connecting to this, when connecting to this. This works a lot like WebRTC. Why? Because it's WebRTC. Mm -hmm. So you get your, um, I don't know if they got a stun server, but they got a turn server. Uh, initially, it's going to try to do a P2P connection between you and wherever your remote is. Uh, if it's not happy with that, it's going to get relayed to Raspberry Pi servers. And maybe you don't have a problem with that, but your company might. Mm -hmm. That might be an issue where you're not going to deal with that with your yeah. standard SSH. So it is encrypted, but you know, no encryption is perfect. And um, yeah, w once you're into like Raspberry Pi Connect, I want to know. Maybe somebody at Raspberry Pi is like, no, this is a use case. And I'm like, awesome, I get it. I am not poo pooing. I was like, I was telling Joe earlier. I'm just like, I, I always try to like, where could this be used? What situation would I have to find myself in to where I would be using this? And I'm like, especially, you know, they say if you have low bandwidth, um, it's a helpful option. I'm like, that's when you would have cessation of a server. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know. I don't know. Let, let yeah. me know if you were like, no, this is dummy. This is how you do it. Because uh, then again, I, what I initially said with this is like, y'all run X sessions on your Raspberry Pis? What? I'm like, you can log into another desktop. I'm like, no, I can't. I don't have X on any of my Raspberry Pis. So, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, there you go. Go check it. Uh, it comes in as all the cool stuff from the Raspberry Pi project at the low, low price of absolutely free. So you can play around with it. Maybe you can run into a use case for yourself. And like Jill said, this thing works on everything. We're running absolutely way too long this week, <laughs> but we got to run out of here. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thanks for watching. If you want to support what we do, 
go over to linuxgamecast.com. That sounds like a strange place, but that's where everything started right there. And that, mm-hmm. you know, this show is stuck together with Linux Gamecast. And uh, we got a support button. We do have a Patreon. We'd appreciate your support there. That'll get you into our Discord and a bunch, bunch of other stuff. If you watch, can't make the live and uncut versions of the show, we got that podcast and, of course, a recording just for you, including a non-YouTube version of this video. Hey, that means no ads. Yay. Because it's going to get nasty. YouTube oh, is still, still rolling out the baked-in ads, and there's nothing you're going to be able to do again. Twitch has kind of gotten bad that way, too. Twitch is uh, Twitch is the best. I don't even know how much I pay because it's so useful for me. Is the Twitch yeah. Turbo or Twitch yeah. Nitro? I know. I pay for that, too. Done. <laughs> I don't have yeah. to see ads why because I don't have to worry about ads on mobile, desktop. I'm when I'm watching Twitch, I'm just watching Twitch. Good to go. But yeah, linuxteamcast.com mm-hmm. forward slash support. We got Libra Pay and all the other stuff. If you want to yeah. kick us some coin, we would appreciate it. And come say hi in Discord, especially if you're a Twitch sub. Um, you can link that up too. All right. Woo-hoo. There we go. I, I look forward to the insightful reasons of why people should never run Windows in the comments. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, Rawr, that's it's so cool. bad. It's evil. <laughs> uh, and you're not wrong. But until next week, mm-hmm. bye bye. Bye, hi, everyone. Love you all. Aw, oh, thank you, Nubbin. He pledged uh, 250 in our Patreon. Yay, Death Note. <laughs> thank you to our executive producers, including our Theron in chat. And our Chicago level people, Super Dust Out, Empty, and Blasphemia. Our Sea Monsters. System T, Mark, Via G, Joe, Dirty Dean, our Death Notes, Renee K, Leonardo K, Kim, Smashley G, and our Chairlings, Hibbard, Douglas, Hitchcock, Mir. <laughs> and yes, as usual, I can't read them all. <laughs> so Ladies read them all and gentlemen, quick. you got the rest of the week to get up something mildly Linux flavored and or nefarious. I'm not going to judge you on. Uh, have a good time doing it. Yeah, keep all those right. penguins marching. Except for that one pink one. <laughs> I don't trust him. He's shifty. <laughs> shifty. <laughs> yep. Aww. That's a shifty pink one if I ever saw one. <laughs> yeah. Wouldn't trust it. I would say as far as I could throw it, but it looks like I could throw that one pretty far. Yeah. <laughs> this one's. Bye, Aww. buddy. We'll see you Bye, next everyone. Week.